Before we get going, I'll need to give you a quick content warning. This episode discusses sexual acts, sexual abuse, and abuse of children. Please be advised. Also, I want to acknowledge here that I'm concentrating on Christianity in this episode, not because abuse doesn't happen in religions outside of Christianity, but because it's my religious knowledge base, and this is where I have more personal experience. I want to be careful about speaking about such a difficult subject as it relates to religious cultures I have little to no experience with. But when I post this on Facebook and Twitter, if you have insight on how this may apply to other cultures, and if you have stories to share, please feel free. I really want to hear where you're coming from. Going away to college, particularly four-year residential colleges and universities, that is often a time when young people are getting out from under their parents' thumbs into an environment where they can figure themselves out. Some responsibility, but not full-on adulthood with spouses and kids and full-time jobs. I remember my first day at Ohio State, where my parents, my sister, and my brother dropped me off, and I was getting ready to go it alone. Coming from a super small, all-girls Catholic high school, I purposely chose a university that was huge, with no friends, no enemies, no one who knew the socially awkward, studious girl who was valedictorian of her high school class. When people think of a large university like Ohio State, most think of a party culture, blowing off class, pledging fraternities and sororities, lots of parties, lots of drinking, lots of sex with lots of people. But that's not exactly what happened in my case. I went in a somewhat different direction. Sure, I didn't study as much as I did in high school, or really as much as I should have. But after a couple of off-campus parties I went to with some girls from my dorm, which were kind of boring, just natty light and drunk people, and breaking up with my high school sweetheart who still lived back at home in Detroit just months after arriving on campus, I quit the party scene and took up the life of a college evangelical. Throughout college, I was involved in campus ministry. It was an experience I would call interesting because I have some great memories of it and some that weren't so fond. But as someone who grew up in Catholic schools and only going to my mostly African-American charismatic church every once in a blue moon, campus ministry, along with church on Sundays, was my crash course in conservative evangelical culture. One of the major themes in evangelical culture that came up a lot when I was in college is sexual purity, which makes sense considering we were all young and in the prime of life. And it wasn't just the don't have sex until marriage spiel. Of course, I was there too, but it was more involved than that. My campus ministry buddies and I would debate the merits of dating versus courtship at retreats, Bible studies, or just while hanging out. Should meeting a significant other be a casual affair where you meet and go out with different people and see where it goes, or a slow process of getting to know one person with the express goal being marriage? And yes, in the age of the popular Christian self-help book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, Dating versus courtship was a heated discussion among my friends in campus ministry. But it went further than that. The idea of sexual purity was huge. Sex was viewed as a gift. And virginity was something you would hold on to until you married the person God has picked out for you. This was especially hammered home for women, though not exclusively. But as I got older, I began to wonder how psychologically healthy this take really was. What if the only worth you see in yourself is being a virgin and nothing else? Or what if you weren't, either by choice or by violence? Were you worthless simply because you weren't pure? And on top of that, what if those who had taught us that sexual purity was of the utmost importance never believed it to begin with? I'm your host, Jay Poole, and this is Potstorer Podcast. It's hard to say what specifically made me want to talk about abuse within churches, particularly sexual abuse, but I have felt the need to talk about this for a while, and I've had this episode in the works. But what really pushed me over the edge was this. A couple of Fridays ago was the funeral of the legendary Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. This was a star-studded, home-going service held at Greater Grace Temple, 
a well-known megachurch in the city of Detroit. It was a ceremony lasting several hours, and from what I saw of it, the service was celebratory of Aretha's life, while also sending pointed messages towards the dear leader, which is not surprising given that it was in my lovely hometown and given the people in attendance, such as President Bill Clinton and Congresswoman Maxine Waters, as well as some controversial figures such as Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and Louis Farrakhan. As I was working that day and missed most of the televised event, I expected to check Twitter and Facebook and see the highlights of the funeral and memories shared of Aretha and her amazing life. But instead, I saw pictures of the pastor of Greater Grace, Bishop Charles Els III, hugging singer Ariana Grande with his hands wrapped around the side of her breast. And she looked very uncomfortable. Not only that, he made this comment. I've got to, I've got to apologize because I have to brush up my 28-year-old daughter tells me, Dad, you are old at 60. <laughs> when I saw Ariana Grande on the program, I thought that was a new something at Taco Bell. Oh Girl, let me give you all your respect. <laughs> Did y'all enjoy this icon? She's an icon herself. That whole moment when I saw the replay was really, really cringe. The joke about Grande's name was very inappropriate and unnecessary, but what was more troubling was how he casually groped her and kept his hand where it was, at a funeral, in front of a huge crowd in attendance and millions at home watching. I want to make it clear that I have no evidence of what I'm about to say, and I'm not going to accuse Ellis of something I have no record of. Disclaimer, I don't know, pure speculation. But the ease in which he groped Grande made me wonder if this wasn't his first rodeo, that he might have a history, just because it came way too easy. He does have a history of scandal, but more of the economic kind. As a few years ago, while on the reality TV show Preachers of Detroit, Ellis was accused of swindling a woman out of a $120,000 home left by her deceased grandmother. But in any case, the groping incident was such a big story, I heard it talked about on a wrestling podcast recorded in the UK. This was huge. And this incident further highlighted the need to address this issue. Well-known megachurch pastor Bill Hybels resigned from his position as founding pastor of Willow Creek, an evangelical megachurch in suburban Chicago, just short of his retirement back in April. He had been investigated by the church for sexual harassment, as well as a long-term affair with a staffer at the church. Hybels has been accused by 10 women, including his former secretary from back in the 1980s, of inappropriate behavior ranging from improper hugging and lewd comments to groping and demanding oral sex. He has denied the sexual harassment and abuse allegations. Initially, the church leadership was defensive regarding the allegations, but when the former secretary spoke up and produced contemporary documents as evidence, Willow Creek's entire board of elders, as well as Heibel's replacement, Pastor Heather Larson, all resigned and issued an apology to the accusers. There's been a great bit of focus on the news regarding priests being accused of molesting children in their parishes. Several agencies around the country, most recently New York and New Jersey, have launched investigations into the several dioceses across the states seeking records of sexual abuse reports and how these were handled. States have also posted hotlines to report abuse allegations. This is on the heels of a Pennsylvania grand jury report that was released August 14th, detailing the sexual abuse of over 1,000 children by 301 priests, including 99 priests from the Diocese of Pittsburgh alone, over seven decades. The Catholic Church has been loath to release the names of accused priests publicly. For his part, Pope Francis has declined comment, himself being accused of enabling a priest here in the U.S. accused of molestation. And before Protestants point the finger at Catholics for child molestation, there have been similar scandals in evangelical Protestantism. Rachel Denhollander is an outspoken anti-abuse advocate and a survivor of sexual assault by Larry Nasser, the doctor accused of molesting more than 150 girls and women while working for USA Gymnastics and Michigan State University, who was convicted earlier this year. Den Hollander has also been outspoken about the scandal involving an evangelical church network, Sovereign Grace Ministries, 
now Sovereign Grace Churches. An expose came out in 2016 detailing several accounts of alleged child rape and molestation against victims spanning three decades. In one prominent case within the church, Nathaniel Morales, a youth mentor at Covenant Life Church in Washington, D.C., which was once part of SGM, had been molesting young boys at the church from the 1980s through the early 2000s, including two of his own stepchildren. Church staff were notified a number of times between 1990 and 2007, but Morales wasn't disciplined and nothing was done, and he was not arrested until 2012, after he had moved on from the church to work at several other churches around the country. This revelation led to the pushing out of C.J. Mahaney, then president of SGM and lead pastor of Covenant Life Church, for allegedly covering up this and other abuses. However, even with this scandal, there were churches supporting Mahaney, including Den Hollander's church in Louisville, who was not part of SGM but partnered with them. This led to her speaking out and eventually leaving that church. So that's just a bit of what has happened recently in terms of American churches and sexual abuse scandals. It shouldn't be surprising given the hashtag MeToo movement and the similar church-centric hashtag church too. More and more people are coming forward with their experiences of sexual harassment and violence, and the light is illuminating this darkness. And I think that there's something particularly evil about the abuse in churches for a couple of reasons. Many of these Christian institutions, the Roman Catholic Church, and many Protestant churches are portrayed as the standard bearers. And it's a calling. It's a calling to live as Jesus lived. Of course, many Christian leaders and individual Christians interpret that in different ways. Being personally chaste, living a pure life, serving other people, standing for truth and love. But however way is manifested, the idea is that Christians are expected to live a moral life and stand for moral values. Christians are also called to be a witness to the gospel, in other words, the good news of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, and the redemption it represents for all of us. We cannot talk about these lofty goals and say that there is this higher standard and not bother to live by that standard ourselves. Of course, no one is perfect. As they like to say, the church is for the sick and not the well. But it's one thing to make a mistake. But seeking out and abusing others is not simply a mistake. It's living as if the way you're telling other people to live doesn't apply to you. It's as if it's not important to live by the example of Christ. And that is the opposite of witness. The other issue is this. While people devote their lives to a lot of things, you can devote yourself to your art, your sport, your skill, your talent, your interest. It can be your driving force. But few of us have what we are into shape our entire worldview, and few of us would die for our craft. But religion, faith in something bigger than ourselves, an entire world we can't see with our own eyes, religion is another thing entirely. Wars have been fought throughout history over religion. People have killed each other over religion. People have sacrificed themselves over religion. Religious faith is sacred. And people will often bypass their instincts, their common sense, their better judgment, their conscience, because they believe that is what their faith requires of them. That's what makes religious faith a unique, powerful force. And this is why using religious faith to use and abuse other people is particularly insidious. Because abuse within the church warps and destroys people, not only physically and mentally as abuse in any arena does, but devastates them spiritually. It strikes at the core of their worldview, how they understand the nature of God and their place in this world. It is an attack on the person's spiritual home and rocks it at the foundation. And it is compounded by the fact that the very people that sexual abuse victims trust the most betray them, not only the abuser, but others within the church that are conditioned to place the unity of the church in submission to pastoral authority over support and protection of those who need it most. But Jay, there are abuse scandals everywhere. Hollywood, Ohio State's wrestling program, USA Gymnastics. Why are these church scandals such a big deal? Why focus on the church and not these other institutions and organizations? I don't think most people are saying that sexual abuse scandals in secular institutions don't matter. I totally think they do. 
I don't think there is something about the church specifically that invites abusers per se. Abusers tend to want proximity to victims in a way to groom potential victims and keep the victims from exposing the abuser. And it's easier to do when the abuser is intertwined with something the victim loves, like a sport, a hobby, a religion. Also, if an abuser can get into a position of power and influence within the institution they're a part of, they have the social capital and trust built up to make it easier to escape serious consequences if discovered. But what I am saying is that there are mechanisms within the church specifically that enable abusers and allow churches to turn a blind eye to problems within the church. And we need to pay attention to those specifically because most importantly, addressing these issues honestly within the church, with the primary concern being protecting potential and actual victims, can reduce these incidents root out the abusers a lot more quickly, and hold them accountable. Let's talk about these mechanisms. I think a big one, particularly in some Protestant circles, is that church tends to have an authoritarian bent. On other episodes, I've talked at length about evangelicalism's leanings towards authoritarianism and pastoral authority. And it plays a role in cases such as the abuse incidents at SGM and to a degree at Willow Creek. But this is a feature of other Christian traditions as well. The black church as an institution is quite similar to white evangelicalism in this sense. There is a religious and cultural expectation to hold the pastor in high regard, especially in black evangelical churches. Evangelical churches, as opposed to mainline churches, tend to have a flattened hierarchy and individual churches often have more autonomy in relation to the national organization, if there is one. So pastors in these churches are given a lot of authority since there's often no one higher to answer to. And within evangelical church circles, the pastor is often revered, and both congregation and leadership often feel it is their responsibility to support the pastor. Roman Catholicism is structured differently than most evangelical churches. There is definitely a structured hierarchy, and it is steeped in tradition. Catholic priests are viewed as being an intermediary between individual parishioners and God They preside over Mass and they administer the sacraments, which are extremely important in the faith. Then there are higher levels of authority, such as bishops and archbishops, and then cardinals. Then there's the Pope. The Pope, the leader of the church, has full, supreme, immediate, and universal power over the church. This is referred to as papal supremacy. The Pope is viewed as essentially being God's representative on earth, not divine like Jesus but representative nonetheless. So authority functions a bit differently here. I would venture to say that as far as individual parishioners, congregants are concerned, even though there are very devout Catholics, in general, you don't see the same authoritarianism within the congregation as you see in white evangelicalism or the black church, since all authority is not in one person or a small group of people they have access to or see on a regular basis but it does mean that the higher-ups take the lead regarding what happens when an abuser is discovered within their ranks. It's quite removed, and the Pope is quite important in terms of guidance. Another mechanism is how the church deals with sexuality, and I think there are some commonalities here among many of the traditions I've focused on here in the U.S. While I spent a great deal of time in previous episodes talking about white evangelicals and abortion, the Roman Catholic Church is a leading opponent of abortion rights, and in the United States, this is one of the few areas of politics the Catholic Church has been vocal about. I live in a very Catholic-heavy region, and I always see signs on local properties owned by the Catholic Church that say, Choose Life, and billboards sponsored by Catholic organizations with pro-life messaging. To be honest, I haven't really come down on Catholicism for this in earlier podcasts, because even though my dad had a Catholic background, I went to Catholic schools growing up and went to the same religion classes my Catholic classmates did. I'm not Catholic, nor have I ever been Catholic. So even though I'm very familiar with the faith, competent enough to discuss it, I don't have a horse in the race in terms of personal investment. Also, while I am pro-choice and I disagree fundamentally with the focus of the pro-life movement, I can respect the Catholic Church's consistent ethic of life a hell of a lot more than the glaring inconsistencies in much of Protestant evangelicalism. But I think there's something here in terms of sexuality that is problematic, that while manifested differently is at its core similar to how sexuality is dealt with in Protestant evangelicalism. 
In both cases, sexuality is seen as this raging force that is imperative to control. Catholic clerical leadership is made up of men who are forbidden to marry, which would seem to lead to some degree of sexual repression. Of course, that definitely does not excuse child molestation. But sexual repression breeds a culture where there is discomfort with sex. According to Catholic doctrine, the primary purpose of sex is for procreation within marriage between a man and a woman. For that reason, other forms of sexual activity are not allowed, including premarital sex, masturbation, and homosexual activity. According to the Catechism, they're in the same category as prostitution, rape, and incest. As for lesbians and gay men, they are not intrinsically sinful, according to the Catechism, as long as they don't have sex and they are called to chastity. Also, pornography and contraception are forbidden, and abortion is considered a mortal sin, a sin that can lead to being excommunicated from the church. So yeah, those are pretty high stakes. Sex is highly controlled, restricted to a very specific set of conditions, and that culture of control attracts abusers who are trusted around their prey, and they strike. Then the leaders, rather than expose what is happening within their churches and risk distrust in leading a membership, they just shift the problem to some other parish, some other diocese, some other group of unsuspecting future victims, and no one talks about it. Now, in Protestant evangelicalism, there tends to be a huge focus on gender roles, falling under either gender fundamentalism or complementarianism. In fundamentalism, women are seen as unequal to men, bolstered by the creation story where Eve gave Adam the fruit and him eating it led to the fall of humanity, the narrative being that the fall was primarily Eve's fault. In complementarianism, women and men are viewed as equal but different. The sexes still have roles, but equal value is placed on the roles in those occupying them. How rigid those roles are depends on the church. But bolstering this narrative is primarily the description of a godly woman in Proverbs 31. But both view men as the head of the household and oftentimes the spiritual leaders, much of it stemming from the male leadership in the Gospels and Paul stating in the epistles, women submit to your husbands and stating that women should be quiet in church. But views on gender roles and gender differences within evangelicalism is kind of odd because on one hand, women are often viewed as the weaker sex, the ones who need to submit to male authority, who need to be protected, but at the same time are expected to dress modestly, behave modestly, be virginal and resist sex before marriage, but are expected to always accept their husband's sexual advances after marriage because in both circumstances, it reigns in the overwhelming male desire for sex. And if you notice, I'm using heteronormative language because much of evangelicalism still condemns same-sex relationships and marriage. So gender dynamics in same-sex relationships or relationships involving people who are transgender don't appear on their radar. But in any case, there is this idea within evangelicalism that women are strong when it comes to controlling the sexual urges of men but men are strong at everything else. Which gets into purity culture. I kind of touched on it a little bit in the open. Many Christian traditions value abstinence before marriage, but purity culture often takes it to another level. Earlier, I mentioned the book I Kiss Dating Goodbye, which instructs readers to abstain from dating, which the author views as loose, shallow, and prone to premarital sexual activity. Instead, he says that we should approach romantic relationships using courtship meaning a guided time of getting to know the person you're partnered with, guided by the woman's parents or her older mentors, with an eye towards marriage. Even kissing and touching is forbidden, as it is said to awaken sexual desire. Purity culture tends to view the condition of being abstinent as the whole worth of a person, especially women, which both demonizes sex as evil, if not practiced in a certain context, and the holy grail only within marriage. The fascinating thing is that I Kiss Dating Goodbye was written in 1997 when the author, Joshua Harris, was only 21 years old and not yet in a relationship or married. This was inspired in part by a book written in the 1980s called Passion and Purity by Elizabeth Elliot. So I Kiss Dating Goodbye was written with almost no personal experience as to what romantic relationships and marriage were actually like. 
Even with that, the book sold 2 million copies and was popular in evangelical campus ministries like the one I was in back in college, as well as among homeschoolers and youth groups. But even Harris was dismayed at some of the ramifications, including an unwillingness for singles to get to know each other in his own church. And many people over the years coming out with stories about how following the advice in his book led to shame, guilt, inability to form meaningful romantic relationships and friendships with the opposite sex, and even marriages rife with domestic abuse, and has within the past couple of years started to come to terms that he may have been at least somewhat misguided. This reckoning is also on the heels of his exit from his ministry career as he had been a staff pastor and mentee of none other than C.J. Mahaney at Covenant Life Church and part of SGM. Researchers Sarah Moon and Joe Rieger wrote an article published in the Journal of Integrated Social Sciences about the themes in evangelical dating books and how these may contribute to rape myth acceptance or in other words, beliefs and attitudes that shift blame for sexual assault from perpetrators to victims and contribute to ongoing sexual violence. The researchers performed content analysis of titles popular within purity culture, including I Kiss Dating Goodbye, as well as other popular Christian dating and courtship books such as Real Marriage by Mark and Grace Driscoll, When God Writes Your Love Story by Eric and Leslie Ludi, and Dateable by Haley DeMarco and Justin Lukadu. These books were found to have messaging that subtly supported benevolent sexism as well as lack of consent, particularly the idea that women needed others as a shield for their purity, first their parents and then their husbands, as well as the message that your body is not your own. In addition, they found that these books described women as commodities, viewing women who had not had sex as pure and prized, while women who had had sex before marriage were viewed as used up, or as the book When God Writes Your Love Story puts it, hamburger meat. The shame is real, y'all. And while the books did mention that men should also be abstinent, there was a theme of women as the gatekeepers for men who are inclined to hunt their prey. As the book Dateable states, quote, Don't tease the animals. Please, please don't tease us. To show us your hot little body and then tell us we can't touch it is being a tease. You can't look that sexy and then tell us to be on our best behavior. End quote. So essentially, men had the freedom without the responsibility while women had the responsibility without freedom. And on top of shaming women who choose to engage in sex outside of heteronormative marriage, purity culture often fails to make a clear distinction between consensual sex outside of marriage and rape, particularly as it relates to sexual purity. And the danger, as it relates to sexual violence in the church, is that purity culture can be used as a weapon. It can discourage victims of sexual abuse from coming forward either due to shame of feeling impure or having sinned in some way, or fear of others viewing them as damaged goods. On top of that, if victims do come forward, purity culture can lead fellow churchgoers and church leaders alike to blame the victim or see the victim as at least somewhat culpable for the abuse. So purity culture can enable abusers and silence victims. So how do we confront and deal with this issue? For starters, how we think matters. And I want to go beyond let's not blame victims or let's listen to people as they come forward with their experiences of abuse and be willing to hold people accountable. As I talked about in the episode Believe Them, this was way back in episode 16, I believe. That is all still important. But particularly for the church, the church needs to go deeper than surface theology or adding on rules that don't exist just to avoid falling into certain behaviors. We need to stop being afraid of sex and sexuality and practice and promote healthy sexuality among consenting adults. Of course, healthy sexuality might mean somewhat different things for different people. But at the core, sexuality is a human instinct, is part of the biological imperative, and it can be a way for people to connect with each other in a meaningful, intimate way. If it is a source of shame, guilt, or pain, then that's not healthy, and working through that with a professional counselor or therapist can be helpful. There is nothing wrong with seeking help. The church should also consider a move towards egalitarianism. 
There are examples in the Bible of women leaders, such as Deborah in the Old Testament and Phoebe and Priscilla in the New Testament. And while the Bible talks about women submitting to their husbands, it also says that husband and wife should submit to each other. People are individuals with different gifts, and it's not based on gender or sex. Some women are natural leaders, and some men are more nurturing and cooperative, and there is nothing wrong with that. The other thing is that if you're a Christian, especially in the evangelical tradition, because this is where I've seen this the most, the church needs to get out of this mentality that every negative story about a beloved pastor or every accusation against someone revered in the church is a spiritual attack or persecution. Too often, the church fails to confront these issues objectively because when they are exposed, the default is to rely on narratives that, at their core, protect the church, its tenets, and its leaders from being questioned. Are spiritual attacks and persecution real? I believe they are. But this language is often overused in order to silence dissent, maintain control, and avoid facing uncomfortable truths. It's important to deconstruct what we believe, and how that contributes to people being victimized within the church. Because going by these and the many other stories I didn't have time to add here, if I did, I'd be talking for days, the way things have been done in the church as it relates to sexual abuse has not been working. And if church is supposed to be a home, a place to find comfort, peace, and healing, and if the good news exists, the church needs to both act like it and be standard bearers holding each other accountable. Because without the church taking a long look in the mirror and rectifying these issues, it loses credibility in our world every single day. I want you to check out our flagship podcast on the Flying Machine Network, appropriately named the Flying Machine Content Channel. It's where various network hosts share original stories, and also talk about various topics that might be a little different than what we cover in our respective podcasts. Right now, we have an episode from Malcolm about prequels, in particular Rogue One, and Justin did one about how video games exploit dopamine production in players to keep them playing longer. And we'll have more episodes coming down the pike pretty soon, so check that out on flymachine.network slash content channel, and subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher. Thanks so much for listening to Pot Stirrer Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or on Android. Go on potstirrerpodcast.com slash download and links are right there. If you subscribe, you can get new episodes once they come out so there's no delay. I want to hear from you. If you enjoyed the podcast, please give us five stars and leave a review. And check out the Pot Stirrer Podcast Facebook page at facebook.com slash Podcast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free. I give you the incredible flying machine.